this is a PyDP11. It's a kit. And once you get it assembled, you too can compute like it's 1975. I'm going to show you how to build one. But first, you'll need to drop the kit's creator, Oscar Vermeulen, a note on his website begging him to send you this kit from his very next batch. The PyDP11 is a scaled replica of a really iconic computer from the 1970s, the Digital Equipment Corporation PDP11, specifically the Model 1170. Of course, the Pi in the kit's name refers to a Raspberry Pi. Behind all the switches and blinking lights, the Pi is the puppet master putting on the show. If you're going to build a replica of a computer, why this one? You could choose that one, or this one, perhaps this lovely mom. Seriously, why would you ever want something that looks like this on your desk? Well, how about this one instead? The funny thing is all the machines you just saw are PDP-11s too. The 11 came in all sorts of shapes and sizes over its 20 plus year production run. DEC started making them in 1970 and they were still making them past 1990. Okay, so this model has some aesthetic advantages. But it's more than just a plummy face. No, no, this was an apex predator in the 1970s. 1975, this thing came out with additional CPU cache and it has a separate bus for CPU and memory. It also has the, the standard Unibus, which is a general purpose IO bus that made the PDP-11s famous. But one more thing it has, it has a dedicated mass bus, that is a, a mass storage uh, interface bus that's dedicated. It's a bit like a SCSI bus, but 15 years earlier. Now this thing, doesn't look like much of a storage system. Uh, but wait. One of these systems would generally have... Oh, this kind of disc. And not just one of them. Uh, this system would typically have two, three, four of those. This is exactly the kind of system that you would have run Unix on. It has all the guts to do database processing or multi-user, multi-processing in an operating system that performed much like what you would expect in the mainframe, but without the mainframe budget. Don't go thinking it's small and cute either. I mean, it doesn't look very big, but in fact, this whole thing... Jesus Christ! This whole thing is the CPU. That's the card cage. This replica is a spectacle of flashing lamps and toggle switches. There was a time when computer manufacturers needed to provide this kind of interface as a low-level way of debugging and testing your systems. You can peek and poke into individual memory locations and walk programs through step-by-step, step, all at the bare machine level. When microcomputers came in, most of this functionality moved into embedded monitors and low-level operating systems. But this replica shows one of the high watermarks of what is often remembered as the era of blinking lights. This video will be the first in a four-part series. We'll start with a little introduction, do some shopping, and then some prep work. In our next video, we charge through the first phase of soldering and testing. Then, in part three, we work on the switches and test them out. And in the final part, we put everything together and give it all a go. So let's get building. Out of the box, we get a bag of components. Bag of switches, two PCBs, a case, and a wooden stand. But we're missing a bit. That's the Pi itself. You'll need to order one of those separately. I picked up the latest and greatest 3B+. You'll also need a modest micro SD card and a power supply. The branded supplies put out a little bit more juice, so I grabbed one of them. We're following build instructions from Oscar's site, Obsolescence Guaranteed. Here's the link. I'll copy all the links into the video notes as well. Our first task is to sort out the Pi. The software element of the kit is covered by the PyDP11 manual, and you can download it here. It tells us first you'll need to image the SD card using a recent copy of Raspbian. You can download one of those from here. Image your SD card from it, mount that in your Pi, and power up. Log in and get yourself onto the network. I'm not going to try and cover Pi basics such as networking in this video, but I'll put a couple of helpful links in the description. Do a full patch update on the Raspbian. Use a terminal window. Use the update command followed by the upgrade command on apt-get to update your Raspbian image. Once update's complete, you'll want to reboot. When the computer's back up, you have to download and install the PyDP11 software kit. Let's kick that off and then I'll explain a little bit more about it. Use a terminal window, 
create a directory to hold the software, and then change into it. Download the software package. Extract that archive file in place on the new directory. Now run the installer script, that'll carry on for a bit. While it's running, we'll do a little multitasking. Open up a second terminal window, and in this one we're going to download a package of vintage software to run under emulation. Make sure you're back in the installation directory, and then kick off another download with this command. Once that finishes, extract all those files from their archive. The manual explains the software components in more detail. It starts with SimH, the venerable emulation library. That provides a base PDP-11 runtime. Oscar's installer hacks the compilation slightly to integrate the real console module. The resulting program gets labeled Client 11. Now, I think that's a bit of a misnomer because this is really the guts of the virtual machine. Oscar also adds on the switch input with a program called ScanSW. Then he wires in the Blink and Bone library as PDP-1170 Blink and Bone Demon. The switches control the startup. The startup script controls which disk images are loaded, and so the Client 11 gets loaded with your choice of vintage OS. The last archive you downloaded contained the contents of the Systems folder. Inside that, you'll find VM configurations and disk images for a collection of operating systems. The main install routine will keep going for some time in the other window. Once all that finishes, we can shut the Pi down and set it aside for the moment. That's it for part one of this series. Part two should follow shortly. More vintage technology videos pop up regularly on Beja Vision, so as always, like and subscribe. See you in part two.